Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and hopefully you're having an amazing day. I want to kick this video off with a discussion of the Zen 3 refresh known as Warhol. We've been hearing a lot about this upcoming architecture, and it's supposed to be a stopgap as we wait for Zen 4 and the introduction of DDR5, which naturally will increase the amount of memory bandwidth significantly, and this allegedly is going to be on the AM5 platform, as I've discussed a few times previously. But Warhol, very little is known about it. We've seen it kind of on leaked roadmaps as Zen 3 Plus, but no real indicator of what's changed versus Zen 3. Like, is it kind of the Zen to Zen uh, to Zen Plus, as we saw with the, say, 1700X to the 2700X, or is it just other changes such as higher clock frequency? Well, we might have some indication now, thanks to uh, Chip Hell. It's a well-known forum, uh, it's a Chinese forum, which honestly a ton of leakers have uh, kind of congregated on, and we've actually got quite a lot of information there, especially from some of the members such as Zhu, which has proven to be very correct in the, in the past. But I would, of course, advocate you take this with a pinch of salt. Nevertheless, the CPU-Z result is said to be about 760 points. I can only say that that is bonkers, crazy, nuts, and insanity. That is an insane level of performance for CPU-Z, and well north of about, no, well north of 100 points, even of a kind of optimized Zen 3-based chip. Furthermore, the clock frequency is said to be possibly up to 5.5 gigahertz, although there seems to be some confusion how Warhol is achieving this. So one theory is that the clock frequency is just really, really high. Another theory is that we see some IPC gains, or of course the other theory is that it's just a combination of both, clock frequency and IPC. Let's go with the IPC games first. So possibly it could be a bit like we saw with the 1700X to the 2700X, i.e. Zen to Zen Plus, where there was about a 3% leap in performance compared to the first Zen architecture. This was AMD doing a few things, not least of which tightening up cache timings and other bits and bobs. So possibly we could see similar here. It's not a huge leap in IPC, but it's enough anyway to raise the performance. But the thing is, the rumors are that that's not really what's gone on here, that there's no major architectural shift. So the other possibility is that AMD are just cranking up the clock frequencies, again, to the rumored 5.5 gigahertz. This would almost certainly mean that they're leveraging a new node. And one possibility is that we're going to be seeing 6NM. So out of these possibilities, let's tackle the new node first. And they could be either using a revised version of 7NM or 6NM. So 6NM is going to be used allegedly for Rembrandt. Well, I was discussing that a few days ago from information with Rogame. And that, of course, is an APU. So it's not unheard of. It's not too difficult to imagine that we could be seeing Zen 3 Plus, again, Warhol, use the same node and then released either late 2021 or possibly 2022, given that frequently, or I guess you could say frequency, is that, I'm sorry, that was awful, is that it, you know, we see the APU slightly lag behind the desktop CPU parts. So that's one option. Again, another option would be something along the lines of an improved Zen, uh, sorry, a, a improved 7NM uh, uh, node. TSMC do have N7P, which is about a 7% speed gain, so that would make some level of sense. There was a ton of rumors that we would see the improved 7NM process utilized for um, RDNA 2, and of course that never materialized, so maybe AMD will be leveraging it for uh, Warhol. Another possibility would actually be uh, the 6NM process from, um, from TSMC, and you can see the advantages here, which is a nice little chart, which is compiled by Anantech. And they are actually starting to do kind of uh, risk production of chips in Q1 2020. And this is from an article which dates back to, uh, I think it's like Q2, yeah, April 2019. So there is definitely a possibility that we could see a new process here. And there is another thing too. Um, Apple are gobbling up a huge volume, at least kind of in the early phase of 5NM, of, well, DSMC's 
5nm. So it would make sense as well from that perspective for AMD to do this. Again, this is a ton of speculation, but you can just imagine the amount of performance that, we're using, that, we, that we could be seeing. There are questions like, is it still going to be on the AM4 socket? I imagine so. I don't think we'll see the transition to AM5 because otherwise it would obviously be a rather large difference. It would also be using you know, DDR5 memory and all that stuff. So I imagine it's AM4, but um, with the process information, we don't have that confirmed by any leaker. So I'm just giving you guys a few options. Um, it could certainly be a combination of small architectural tweaks, given they're going to be uh, shifting to a new node anyway. It's not like you can just copy and paste it, you know, go to Photoshop, transform, shrink it down a few percent and then throw it onto the new node. It doesn't work like that. There are some tweaks that they need to make naturally for the production on a new node anyway. So they might go ahead and say, well, you know what, we've got to do this anyway. Let's throw some more engineering resources at this, really improve the node. And this, of course, will also help them fend off future Intel processors. Speaking of which, do 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 write you on um twitter i'll link their of course profile in the video description has also uh, provided us much more information regarding the performance of rocket lake and again this processor is looking to be rather impressive with the leaked results of the 11900. So according to their information, Rocket Lake S-Test, the CPU-Z, you can see the screenshot here, we're looking at 45 slash 41, obviously those are the multiplier, with the single thread result being about 600 points and the multi-thread score being 6, sorry, 5,686. But Cinebench R20, the single thread score is 1444. And finally, R20 is for single thread 561 with multi thread of 5214. They also mentioned that some information about the uh, 11900K CPU Z single thread maybe can reach 700. Who knows? They also mentioned a couple of times that they do have some testing. Uh, it's the same IPC games, but they can't show you because NDA. I mean, I would imagine that they're kind of breaking NDA anyway, but I'm just guessing. We also have more information on this. This is from CPU-Z, uh, user on Twitter, 9550pro. Again, I'll link their profile in the video description. And they've basically provided information of an engineering sample Rocket Lake processor, which is 11900. Um... Here we have the single thread performance of 582, which is about on par with a 10900K. However, um, the multi thread score is 5262, which is actually slower than the 10700. Although you do need to take into consideration that these are engineering sample processors. So, of course, their clock frequency is certainly not running at its full potential. The way it's looking right now, Lower thread count uh, applications, again, like games or even some kind of uh, encoding tasks, which don't necessarily scale super well across tons of cores, may do rather well with Rocket Lake, depending on whether the clock frequencies we've been hearing of 5.3 gigahertz and overclocking to 5.5. I don't know what it is with 5.5 at the moment, um, but assuming that's true, I can definitely imagine Intel uh, taking some victories from AMD I know I keep saying this, but it's really going to be down heavily at this point to whether or not um, Intel can get the pricing correct. Another thing that kind of irks me about what the rumors are for Intel is that they've not fixed certain fundamental, um, I, I want to say, kind of annoyances of their solutions. For example, the fact that you need a Z board for, you know, completely unlocked overclocking and that type of thing. If those were not problems, if they, you could use like a cheaper board and, you know, more of their processors had like full unlocking and all of this stuff, I think they would have a much um, more compelling uh, a solution. But it's going to be down to pricing and if the rumors are for the CPUs that they are extremely power hungry that could also be quite a potential problem too. Finally, we've talked a lot about CPUs, let's throw GPUs into the equation too. RDNA 3 and uh, NVIDIA's Lovelace architecture. 
Lovelace is said to be kind of an interim between Ampere, which of course we're on now with RTX 30, and what we were hearing about Hopper, which was an MCM-based GPU. Hopper was said to be first, but NVIDIA apparently have delayed it, and we're going to be seeing Lovelace. Well, Kobe 7 Kimmy, who's become extremely well known for NVIDIA leaks, has basically all but confirmed at this point that it will be leveraging 5nm Samsung. I did actually cover this recently, um, based upon what I was hearing, as and also interpreting some of the stuff that Kopiti had said in public. But at this point, I think it's pretty damn likely that we will be seeing a Lovelace on the 5nm process. I suspect that there will be pretty big architectural changes. I don't think it's going to be a huge, huge, huge thing like we saw with Hopper. Obviously, we're not going to be seeing MCM. But I do think there will be some fundamental changes uh, for Lovelace, and I suspect it's probably going to be the RTX 40 series. I'm hearing Lovelace is only going to be for gaming, but, you know, maybe that will change. Maybe they will be le leveraging it for other things too. Um, ultimately, though, it's going to make things very interesting because about the point that this comes onto store shelves, RDNA 3 will be a thing. And RDNA 3 is also said to be an MCM kind of design. And it's going to be a question of... Um, well, multiple actual questions, coming to think of it. The first is, who's going to have a better process technology? Obviously, if Lovelace is not using MCM design and RDNA 3 is, that could be a leg up for NVIDIA, but it's also going to come down to sheer raw performance of, you know, the, the CUDA cores or stream processors or whatever you want to call them, the shaders on the GPU, ray tracing performance, clock frequencies, yada, yada, and yada. And RDNA 3 is rumoured at this point, and actually Kopati pretty much hinted that this is true, to be a multi-GPU kind of die, and it's also going to, of course, have I.O. on it and all of that stuff. I am hearing RDNA 3 is a very big improvement to RDNA 2. It's, you know how RDNA 1 to RDNA 2 was kind of like, you know, like that? This is said to be kind of the same thing. And there are some big differences I'm hearing, obviously on ray tracing, which is kind of like, well, duh, of course they're gonna improve ray tracing for natural reasons, but also geometry performance. And an AMD employee basically confirmed that uh, Infinity Cache isn't going anywhere and it's gonna be an RDNA 3, although I can't remember who said the quote. I'll try to plonk it on screen if I do remember. I think I did cover it in a video though, so you could probably search RDNA 3 Infinity Cache and it'll probably come up. Um, so I think that the many of the fundamentals that we saw are going to continue forward because obviously Infinity Cash has a ton of advantages. Honestly, I wouldn't be super surprised if a larger cash is also one of the changes that we see with Lovelace 2. Um, but honestly, just I'm super excited to see what the future of GPUs can bring to the table. RDNA 2 has been kicking ass and it's really great. Uh, I think it's amazing that AMD finally have kind of this compelling argument you can make. And there is a lot of heated debate of RDNA 2 is better, NVIDIA is better, kind of blah, blah, blah. But you know what? The fact that we can actually have this conversation and both sides have a really good point, I think that's kind of key. So I am really excited to see what the future holds. So for CPUs, GPUs, I think it's going to be a really amazing 2021 and 2022. And I'm going to let you all go. Hopefully you have enjoyed the video. If you did, then subscribe to the channel, of course, if you've not already done so. And also ring the bell icon because it's YouTube. And also a quick fun question for you. I have thrown a poll on Twitter. You can vote if you're a Twitter type of person. Where I asked if Master Chief was thrown into Doom 2016 with his default loadout, which is of course the rifle, the pistol, uh, halo type grenades, and he could grab any of the items he needed to kind of clear Doom 2016 for plot reasons, would Master Chief be able to clear Doom 2016? Would he be able to do it easily? Would he barely scrape through? Eh, he would do that, he would do well, but you know, the end kind of demons would take him out, or would he basically get killed by the first zombie he saw? Let me know your thoughts. With all that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.